theme for Holocaust Memorial Day 2022 is one day. And this year for Holocaust Memorial Day, we'll be looking at the welcome that Jewish refugees had when they came to the five West Yorkshire districts. We'll be visiting sites in Bradford, Calderdale, Kirklees, Leeds and Wakefield. And we'll be meeting people whose families came and to hear their stories about how they built new lives in West Yorkshire. We're here because we're actually standing on the site where my parents had their first factory when they came to England and when they started their enterprise in Elland in West Yorkshire. And actually what's amazing is that the wall that was the facade of the factory is still here. It's still standing. It was here when I was a child but I was so delighted and surprised to find that it's still standing today. Because they built this wall probably in the late 40s um, and they built it with their own hands having arrived here from from their travels across Europe after their survival in Lithuania during the Holocaust. They also had with them by that time my mum's cousin, Valdemir Ginsberg, and his wife, Ibi Ginsberg, who had also survived. Val had been in Auschwitz following his uh, transportation from the ghetto in Lithuania, and Ibi had also, and they'd also, and they'd met there, and they came, they came here and joined my parents. And what did the factory here make? They, they made rough blankets, initially. And from there he then developed the ideas for Gannix, which was a revolutionary fabric. From, and from that a whole enterprise grew up. And the main factory, they very quickly moved into a much bigger factory, which is again just down the road from here. I think in Yorkshire they were welcomed with great warmth. My mum always spoke about the fact that she was expecting the British to be very snooty and very hoity-toity, as she would say. And she was extraordinarily surprised and delighted when she got on the bus and somebody said to her, hey, up, love, you're new around here, aren't you? And uh, she was very surprised and very delighted to be greeted with such warmth. Well, I think Jen's story is a great example of the way that the towns and communities in Calderdale have, have welcomed people who are fleeing persecution. And that's a tradition that continues today. We declared ourselves a, a valley of sanctuary and we have you know, a whole range of community groups that, that, that look at providing support to asylum seekers and refugees. Of course, the other thing Jen's stories reminds of is the huge contribution that people from very different and diverse backgrounds then come and make to our community as well. One day, safety for all. One day, celebration of difference. For the past five years, six million plus charitable trust have been creating giant figures of weeping sisters to give with artists, local people, students and refugees in West Yorkshire. The weeping sisters are 12 foot high puppets who represent the grief and suffering of women who have witnessed genocide. The younger participants who work with six million plus to give with their families thought it might be interesting to imagine having a conversation with each of the sisters about their life experiences, whether they took place in the 3rd century or in the 1930s or now. Together, we thought about their stories, their countries and cultures, and what we might want to know about each one. <laughs> The night before our execution, twelve of us were held together in a cell with a window. I sat next to it all night, my last chance to look at the night sky. At dawn, we were led out and lined up, facing a brick wall. There was an almighty explosion. But we were still alive. They had shot high. In fact, our sentence was to go to Auschwitz. A quick death exchanged for a slow death. How can people be so cruel as to stage a mock execution? 
this still affects me today. It's real brave for you to bring back to those days and share this with us. Do you know what happened to your family and are you still in contact with them? My mother and I were the only survivors of my family. My father, who enjoyed cooking with me, was murdered. My brother, who used to swim and walk with me, was killed in action at Stalingrad. We were forced to register as another race. Then they took my father away. They said they were taking him to work for them and afterwards they would let him come home. But that was the first lie. We never saw him again. I can't imagine what that was like for you. You must have been very frightened. Yes, we were. And then, even worse, they took my older sister. I don't like to think about why they took her. What were you feeling when they took her? I felt completely heartbroken, like a piece of me was missing and gone forever. There wasn't a day I didn't think about her. My life changed completely. It was terrifying, my worst nightmare. They wouldn't let us see our sons and husbands. Some were killed instantly, others were taken away. We hoped they were held prisoners and waited for their return, but of course they weren't coming back. It is estimated that 8,000 men and boys were killed by Serb forces at Srebrenica. Bosnian Serb forces captured Jepa the same month and exploded a bomb in a crowded Sarajevo market and after that the rest of the world began at last to respond to what was going on, the murder of ordinary families. Wow, it's just horrifying that something like this could happen in Europe. Could you tell me how this affected you personally? I lost 30 close relatives in my family as a result of the events in Srebrenica. Among them, my sons and my husband. started with an uncle of mine inventing the spare collar, the way of attaching a collar after it had been worn for many times, rather than, as we had in Britain, a stiff collar that swung over. And that was in Vienna, and, uh, and obviously just before the war. And uh, the company there was quite successful, but then uh, the Anschluss came, the Germans were about to march in, and we had a German spy in the company, and he came to see my father because he quite liked him and said, I suggest that you after I leave tonight I'll have forgotten to do the safe up, you go there and get whatever cash you can and go and don't come back. And how did they come to Wakefield? Well it's a very interesting story, the whole family, there were, there were seven brothers and sisters and they were all heading for America and some had got there and some had not and my father was in finishing what he had to do in Switzerland. What happened was the American passage was stopped completely, there were no flights to America so they looked again and a friend of my aunt in Bournemouth vouched for them to come to England. So they flew from, um, from Switzerland to London. And they were in London for quite a while and then the, what happened, as you know, in London the bombing started and so everybody was evacuated from London. We were evacuated to Oxford and I was born in Ruskin College, Oxford. And uh, while we were there we applied for jobs that were none and then so we applied for permission to set up a company. And we got a permission to start a factory in one of the northern towns and uh, nobody knew what those were, so coin flip five times and we came to Wakefield. Um, when we got to the station, there were three people standing on the station. The manager of the Ministry of Labour, the manager of, H of Midland Bank then, and a donation angel, and those three set out to help us set up a business, find a house, find a place to, to work, find some labour, find some cloth, all those things. So it happened right there on the platform when the train arrived in Wakefield. A terrific welcome from any town. I don't think anyone can tell that story. It would only be Wakefield you could tell that story about. Tracy, as the Mayor of Wakefield, 
it's a wonderful story that and Wakefield's always had a tradition of welcoming people hasn't it? It has yeah and it's lovely to hear your story about how welcoming and supportive they were at that time helping you set up business and employing local people so that's been a, a great benefit to the city your family arriving here has been a great asset and we we're so pleased that we were able to do that and it still goes on today as we know we still accept a lot of people into the district and welcome and support them and that's what we want to do because we want to continue having a rich cultural heritage here in Wakefield. One day towards unity in our city. One day may we continue to work together forever for the benefit of refugees. We're at this building, Robert. Why did your father come here and what was important about it? Well, this ended up being my dad's home. My dad was born and brought up in a place called Van Eichel near Essen in Germany. And uh, after Kristallnacht, his father was uh, taken away and his mother put him uh, on the Kindertransport, which was a, a, an organisation to bring child refugees to the UK. And uh, she put him on a train when he was 13 and a half and sent him to originally to Horwich Ho and then uh, ended up in Bradford in this building, which was his home for uh, all of his teenage years. And what was this building used as for him? It was a hostel for 23 boys. Um, it was set up by uh, the, the Jewish community, but built around the community in Bradford who took in these refugees. And my father was always very grateful for the fact uh, that the people of Bradford uh, helped him to survive the Holocaust. And your father went on to join the British Army in well. He did indeed. Um, we know from his war records that he tried tried to join up the British Army twice before he was of age and as soon as he was 16 uh, he, he joined up. Um, when he, before he joined up he worked in one of the textile factories here, Stroud Riley's, and there was a guy there that was a weaver that was learning Morse code and between the two of them they taught each other Morse code and so when he, when he uh, signed up and he filled in his form as to what skills he had he answered no to everything except did he know Morse code and the answer was yes and so he got uh, trained as a signals officer and ended up as part of the Seaforth Highlanders a Scottish regiment and so my dad always boasted the fact that he was the only Jewish Yorkshireman that was entitled to wear a kilt. It's a lovely story. Now Bev, I understand that you work today with people who've arrived and are still arriving as refugees and asylum seekers into Bradford. I do, yes, and I think, well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Robert, for coming along and sharing this very poignant story. It's incomprehensible to even think about a 13 and a half year old going across the world, doesn't know the language, doesn't know anybody, leaving all his family behind, and coming here to Bradford, which has always been and continues to be a city of sanctuary. I just find it incomprehensible that we are not learning our lessons from past history. We need somebody to, a leader that's going to be brave enough to stand up to everybody and say, what the hell is going on? We all need, need to be united, work together, love our neighbours as we'd like to love ourselves, treat people with respect regardless of colour, gender, faith, culture. For goodness sake, we all need to come together. Be kind. Kindness costs nothing. Thank you very much for that. It's very, very One day, good will triumph over evil. One day, peace will overcome violence for good. Liesl, can you tell us your full name and where you were born? My name is Liesl Carter. It was Maya, 
M-E-I-E-R, and I was born on the 26th of August 1935 in a place called Hildesheim near Hanover. How old were you when circumstances began to change for your family? What led you to leave Germany? I was only just four when my father was murdered. Hitler had a big thing about Jews. He didn't like them. He was having them transported and murdered and wiped out. He wanted to rid the, the earth of Jews. I think that was his whole policy. And because I was Jewish, this was what was happening. And life was very, very difficult for people there. They weren't allowed to, to go to the cinema or they had to walk in the gutter if people were on the pavements. And I've seen all this in new re news reels. Fortunately, I was too young to, to be affected by, by most of it. I remember uh, my mother had friends round and they were sat whispering. They weren't talking in loud voices. Um, I mean, it were, everybody was always very, very nervous. But I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't know that things were going to get so bad. So tell us what happened to your mother first. <clears throat> well, my mother applied to come to England as a domestic. This was just before war started and she was granted her exit, but she couldn't take me with. She had to leave me behind. And I was left with, I think, some members of the family. And then I was in a children's home, but that part of my history, I, I really don't remember at all. What happened to you next? Finally, they got permission for me to leave the country. This was in December 1939, where the world was already at war. Uh, and I travelled through Germany um, up to Sweden. And I was in Sweden for a, a short time and then on to, on to Norway. The, the lots of blanks, because don't forget, a little girl of four only remembers special things and I remember being in Norway um, and it was Christmas and I was taken to a, a, a children's panther, the equivalent to a pantomime and I was given a doll and pram. And tell us about the traveling you know because what you haven't said so far is that you were a lot of the time that you were traveling on your own. Yes I was traveling on my own. First of all I had to go to Berlin to get my uh, exit visa stamped it said on that I didn't have to pay the due tax which was a J-E-W tax which all Jews leave in Germany had to pay I don't know how much it was I think it was about 20 marks which was a lot of money in the 19 late 1930s early 1940s and I was being passed on from one person to another um, put on trains and yeah, sometimes sitting in a compartment, sometimes sitting in the, the walkway between one carriage and another. But I really don't remember much of that journey, just that I was just being shuffled about from pillar to post. And you, you stayed with the Norwegian family, didn't you? Just it wasn't yes. very long. I was with the Norwegian family, I think, for about maybe five or six weeks. Um, until sometime towards the end of January 1940 when I was put on a boat to come to England. Um, the Norwegian family were very good to me. They, they took good care of me. When I got to England, I was first of all living with a, a man and his housekeeper in Hull because my mother was working for a family where the, the husband was a very sick man, and they didn't want a little four-year-old running around um, upheavaling the whole household. So I lived with, I can't even remember the, the man's name now, a long time ago. And I lived, I lived with this man and his housekeeper, but it wasn't a very happy time for me at all. And where did you end up? With which um, eventually um, my mother. Uh, got another job with a, um, a refugee family that lived in Harrogate. 
but obviously they didn't want a little five-year-old running around. So she went to the Jewish Refugee Committee in Leeds and they gave her several names of families that wanted to a obviously adopt but definitely look after a refugee child and um, I went to live with Jack and Mary Wynne in Chapel Town. And you grew up and you created a family of your own didn't you? And I grew up and I I went to um, went to school here in Leeds and then I met my husband and against all odds we married in 1958 and I went on to have three children, a boy and two girls. And I was very, very happy. I kept in touch with my um, adopt, I say adopted family until um, Uncle Jack died and then Auntie Mary. But I still kept in touch with her until she died in the early 1980s. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. And finally, finally, what, based on your experience, knowing what happened, what, what's your message to everyone, especially to young people? Uh, yes. Do not be prejudiced because a person is a different colour or speaks a different language or worships a, another temple or, or church or anything. These are things that are thrust onto you when you're a child anyway. You don't get the choice. You're born into whatever you're born into, but you shouldn't have prejudice because your parents or your friends at school say you can't be friends with so-and-so because they're um, a Muslim or a, a Catholic or a Jew or they're black or the blue or the green. It, this is wrong. Make your own opinions. If you've got a friend that is not the same color as you or doesn't go to the same church, if they're very, if you're very friendly and they're nice with you, stay friends with them. Don't be falling out because you're told to because of your family background. This is terrible. Prejudice is a terrible thing. That's that's my message. Judge people by your standards, and if somebody's nice to you, be nice back to them. Chapeltown district of Leeds. Behind me is the plaque for the Ort School. Ort stood for the Organisation for Rehabilitation and Training. It's a fascinating story of how 106 Jewish boys were rescued from Berlin from Nazi Germany and were brought in 1939 to Leeds. And in fact one of them, Sidney Sandler, aged 102, is still alive and living in Leeds today. Thank you Nigel for sharing your story. Or through the art school that existed for only three years. Its establishment played a vital role in saving the lives of over 100 German Jewish boys. And it's encouraging to know the building remains a place of education now for the Muslim girls. It is important that we continue to remember Leeds as an area of safety and refuge for the refugees escaping the Holocaust. Many of whom were able to build successful businesses and employ many people contribute to the success of the city. Holocaust Memorial Day gives us a chance to commemorate and remember those who tragically lost their lives in the Holocaust and other genocides around the world. It is also an opportunity for us to reframe our commitment for never forgetting the lessons of the past as together. And we continue working towards a better future for everyone. Thank you. One day, unity for all. One day, remembering the past for the future. So the 
centre we opened in 2018 after being established by a Leeds-based charity, the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. So the exhibition came out of the survivors themselves, we're a survivor-led organisation and the centre is continuing their stories when sadly they're no longer here, but also using that as a basis of education. Um, and education not only about the Holocaust, but on current issues on extremism, prejudice, discrimination, racism. And we're unique. We are the only exhibition, Holocaust exhibition, based on a university campus in Europe, which means we have academic footing, we have brilliant contacts and real credibility. It's very important and we're really proud to be able to host it here in, in Huddersfield. Um, I, I have to say I, I have visited Auschwitz in, in Poland, um, which is a very profound experience as, as one would know who's, who's been there. And, and this is just as important and as profound as that. And it, it's, it's great to have somewhere that, that shows the awfulness um, of the Holocaust. We need to be reminded of this that happened then and which is still continuing to happen or has happened since. We want to rid our society here in Kirklees, in Huddersfield, um, of that hatred, that discrimination, that prejudice against any member of, of society. One day, safety for all. One day, celebration of difference. This Holocaust Memorial Day, we remember the six million Jewish lives that were lost during the Holocaust, as well as victims and survivors of genocides across the world in places like Bosnia and Rwanda. We must never forget the impact of such horrific crimes and continue to remember those who were murdered for just simply being different. Remembering the Holocaust is vitally significant, not just for the Jewish community, but for all of us. We only have to look at the news and we can see that anti-Semitism and other forms of racism are still rife in our society. This cannot continue. Jewish people and people from all backgrounds are welcome here in West Yorkshire. Our diverse communities are our strength and should be celebrated. The theme of this Holocaust Memorial Day is one day. It asks us to remember all those whose lives were changed overnight simply because they were seen as being different. It also refers to the hope we all have for a kinder society one day. So today, I encourage people of all backgrounds in West Yorkshire to stand together in solidarity with the Jewish community to increase understanding of the past and to celebrate our differences. Racism of any kind has no place in West Yorkshire, but I'm hopeful for a better future for us all one day.
Yeah. 